Namaste, everybody. Good morning uh, to all those viewers in the US and good evening to all the viewers in India. Uh, thank you for joining us in the green room. Uh, truly excited that, uh, you know, this series has been very, very well received and we have had a great response, uh, truly overwhelmed by all the messages and all the kindness and love and blessings that uh, all of you have uh, given this show. So uh, thank you for doing that. And, you know, thank you for joining us every week. Uh, I would also like to thank Jankar organization in Cincinnati for supporting this initiative and for helping spread the word and, you know, being such an integral part of the show. So uh, thanks to Jankar and thanks to all of you. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward to introducing somebody who actually doesn't need an introduction, somebody who has uh, been uh, such a prominent figure on the Indian music scene for so many decades now, someone who's a saxophone virtuoso, a great composer, a great colleague, a great, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an elder brother to me, um, someone uh, with whom I've had the honor of working for several years now, uh, touring uh, across the US and also in India. So uh, without uh, any further delay, I, I would like to invite uh, Maestro uh, George Brooks G to join us for this great conversation and this, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, I would like to invite him in the green room. Well, thank you, Aditya. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here in the green room with you. Uh, I have to say last week, I was fortunate to be in my, turn on my computer while you were uh, having your conversation with Trilok Gertu. And uh, what, what an entertaining speaker, what a great musician and what a uh, fascinating life story um, he, he has. I mean, he's somebody who, uh, you know, I've looked up to as an artist for, uh, you know, for as long as I've been aware of him. I think that was probably when he first started playing with Oregon. And, mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, followed that up, uh, you know, uh, to, with his playing in, in John McLaughlin's trio and then his own albums. And, uh, you know, I've had the, the amazing good fortune of performing with him on a number of occasions. Um, so it was very, it was really very entertaining to hear his story. I think I wrote, I typed in a comment that somebody should make a, uh, well, either he should write his memoirs or somebody uh, should make a movie of his life. I'm not sure who would play Trilok Gurtu <laughs> in the Trilok Gurtu movie. But I mean, sure. you know, I would like to thank you on behalf of Jankar and all the viewers for making time to join us. Uh, Georgie, it's truly an honor, uh, you know, having known you for so many years and, uh, you know, watched you, performed with you, learned so much about world music and, and, you know, you've been such a great ambassador for bridging the gaps between, you know, uh, uh, the US and India and, you know, uh, bringing jazz and Indian classical music uh, uh, to create something new, you know, uh, to be part of the world music uh, scene. So uh, thank you so much for, you know, the great contribution to this, uh, this genre of music. Uh, through your, uh, you know, I think, you know, years of hard work and learning. And we will get to that, uh, you know, in kind of the second session of our uh, conversation. But uh, I would uh, like to invite you to go ahead and perform or, you know, uh, present whatever you have for us uh, in the beginning. I will. I will perform. I think it's, it's important for me to um, just say that here I am performing, but the background of what's been going on in in our country you know i can't i can't um i can't ignore that because um hopefully these are unprecedented times that are moving towards some great change and you know i grew up in the uh well i was born in the 50s grew up in the 60s so you know martin luther king uh malcolm x the uh, civil rights movement was you know very very strong part of my upbringing and um, changes were made, but bigger changes have to be made. So uh, it's just very important for me to acknowledge um, George Floyd, who, who lost his life at the hands of, you know, uh, violent racist police activity and, uh, you know, and, and so many others. So, you know, I want to offer solidarity to the people who are protesting peacefully the young people, especially who are out on the streets, demanding that 
uh, systemic racism has to be removed from our society. And as artists, you know, we're involved in music all the time. We spend a lot of time alone developing our craft, but for me at least, the whole purpose is to uh, create a better environment for all the all the beings on the planet. You know, we, we like to put forth a mes message of love, of compassion, of, uh, of equality. So I we, we, we truly appreciate your kind words, uh, Georgie, and let's hope, uh, you know, the almighty has love and blessings for all of us ac across humanity. Definitely, because we are one people, one planet. So with that being said, you know, my journey has, and we'll talk more about it, as you said, began in New York and somehow found its way to India pretty early on in my life. Um, and I'm, so, I'm so glad it did. I'm so glad it did. <laughs> I am too. It's, it's not anything anyone could have predicted, but, um, you know, and, and so many incredible artists along the way have... Um, my tambour is supposed to be coming on, but it's not on. Let's see why. Um, that's interesting. Okay, my drone doesn't seem to want to play at the moment. Um, so you, you can you can take your time to restart it or something if you need to. It's fine. I mean, it makes a it's a it, you know the, the ambience with the tanpur are really will be nice. Okay. Yes. So so yeah. So my path has been. Um, working okay now it's working too much so we get the volume right so yeah so my path as an american saxophone player has been looking for ways to i guess bridge my love of indian culture and indian music with my love of american culture and jazz music and i've been fortunate to work with you and your guruji and and so many other incredible musicians so I'm going to start with a little alap in uh, Radhpuri Dineshri, which is, I think, perfectly appropriate for the time in India. And we'll just pretend that it's that time in California. Sure. California. So I, I leave it to uh, the stage is all yours. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
It's just a, a little taste. You still there, I bet you? <laughs> um, so that piece, I mean, or my exploration of this raga, Puriya Dineshri, worked its way into a composition that I eventually recorded with a group of mine called Summit that um, featured a number of great musicians. Uh, Zakir Hussain was playing tabla. Uh, Steve Smith was playing drums, so the rhythm section was rather extraordinary. Kai Eckhart was playing bass, who um, 
as we had mentioned, Trilo Gertu earlier had performed uh, for many years with uh, both Trilo Gertu and John McLaughlin. And then Fareed Haq was the guitarist. So that was a group I had called Summit. That, And I used that composition to explore the concept of um, Peshkar, Zakir playing Peshkar against what, what I would call sort of a jazz lahira or a jazz nagma. And uh, that particular raga is really intriguing to, to, I think, to Western musicians. I mean, it's, it's beautiful and, um, and somewhat, I think of it as somewhat mysterious because there's a lot of what in the West we might call harmonic tension where you've got the drone notes. <laughs> Sapa, the gaz there. So it's this what we call in the West a major triad. But superimposed over that is um, what in the West we would call a minor pentatonic scale that's just a half step away. And the half step in in Western music is the smallest interval we have. So two notes rubbing against each other so closely creates that kind of tension. <laughs> So can you hear the tambora and the uh okay. So you know that piece. We perform that a lot with uh, you and Ronan uh, Majumdar and Larry Coriel, our band, group Bombay Jazz. Um, I think it was a successful composition in that it really created a comfortable space for a classical Indian artist to perform and it created a comfortable space uh, for a Western jazz musician to, to explore as well. So I, I, I felt good about that composition. And from that alap, or well, usually when we play live, there's an alap, and then there's that lahera, um, that it's like one, two, three, oh. <laughs> like that unusual um, structure for a layer up but works uh, you know certainly worked great with uh, Zakir and with you and uh, DJ Gatte the different artists who worked um, on that piece um, and then and then it had what you know in my mind is kind of a uh, gut type of composition <laughs> So where the melody starts and then lands on the sum, and then it moved into a funk section, two, three. covered a lot of ground. It kind of had this very classical opening with the Peshkar. And I have to say, I mean, Peshkar is still maybe my favorite part of, 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 a, of, a, of a tabla solo. I find it so, um, so poetic and uh, so, you know, sort of has that intangible artistic quality that, 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 I, that I love hearing in, uh, you know, in any kind of musical display. So um, maybe I'll talk about another piece from that same album. That was from the Summit album. And then a piece that sort of became my hit among a lot of the uh, classical musicians in India who were looking um, 
to expand their horizons to the West. I, I wrote a piece called McCoy, and um, that was written as a tribute to the great uh, pianist McCoy Tyner, who was the, uh, the pianist in John Coltrane's quartet. And John Coltrane is like, you know, like, uh, you know, maybe the, the, the Ravi Shankar, the Badi Gula Mali Khan of, you know, of, of jazz saxophone. He's both a uh, kind of a technical master, a, um, a deep spiritual being, you know, kind of person who was looking uh, and, and expressing that he was searching for kind of a spiritual understanding through his music. And his music was also like at the highest level, both um, in, in kind of his theoretical explorations as well as his technical mastery and his ability to express incredible emotion through sound. I mean, that, that was something I saw when I first started hearing Hari Prasad Chirasi also. He struck me, he struck me as in some way a, a, a analogous, a kind of a brother to, to, to what I was hearing, that, that ability to make one note that expresses, um, you know, just so much depth in, in, in one sound as well as all the technical ability to, uh, to back it up. Um, so McCoy, it's kind of interesting, my background, and we'll talk more about it later, in Indian music started in the north and started singing raga and dealing with alap and um, understanding the relationships of the notes. But, and, and rhythm came later into uh, you know, my, my education of Indian music. North Indian rhythm first, and then South Indian rhythm. And this piece, although I wrote it, you know, quite a while ago, over 20 years ago, so my understanding was less than it is now, I hope. <laughs> it's still, it still used, you know, I, I was playing with these ideas of, okay, I've got six beats, how do you divide that? That could be divided as five and seven, it could be divided as three fours, it could be divided as four threes. And, um, so that that helped that helped kind of structure this composition, and again, it stays um, it stays within a mode, and depending on how you hear it, it uh, it can appear in the mind of an Indian uh, melodic artist as as being a couple of different ragas. But um, it opens with this statement in six that's divided, uh, like I said, into five and seven. <laughs> But I have to change my. Well, I'll keep my drum there. That's fine. <laughs> right. So that's just a pretty simple. Didn't talk at the talk at the dot. Didn't talk at the talk at the dot. Didn't talk at the da. Five seven five seven five seven sum. And then, and then it, there's a little break that's a little more complicated. <laughs> kind of more like 11 and 13, which equals 24, which is two times 12, which is four times six. So again, I don't come to the ideas mathematically. It's not like I have the formula first, but I'm fortunate that when things are going well, I hear these melodies and then, and then I uh, look for an understanding of, of, of what's happening melodically. So I'll say that again. actual melody of the piece comes in. And again, it works with this idea of five and seven, six and six. So shifting that focus of, um, you know, of, of what's happening, but with the three underlining, underlying it. <laughs> Thank you. 
tap at the same time. I need two hands. <laughs> So that piece goes on like that. Um, and, you know, I was very fortunate that you learned it, Rono Da learned it, uh, Purbayan Chatterjee has learned it on the sitar, Kala Ramnath on the violin. So I've been able to play it with, um, you know, with lots of, lots of Indian artists, which is obviously great fun. And then of course, people like Louis Banks and Gino Banks, people, the fusion artists from India have been uh, very gracious with me as well. So you also asked me um, when, in our, in our run up to this uh, about a piece that I'd written, you said uh, maybe it was in Patdeep. And if I left the drone on, on G, it would be in Patdeep. If I move the drone to D, it becomes, uh, it becomes Charukeshi. So, and that's, and that's a really, that whole reality is very fascinating. Again, I think for a, a Western jazz musician, this idea of, mm. because we, we talk about modes, which means you could take a one, any scale, any set of notes, any raga, and if, and if you perform it from a different sa, from a different root, it becomes a different raga. In this case, we've got um, Charukeshi. Which then becomes, if you look at it from Ma, it becomes Pat Deep. If you look at it from, um, from Ni, it becomes uh, Vachaspati. From Sa. From Ma. But we've got the drone going. Actually, yeah, I'll just leave it like that and do. So, you know, when I first started composing, I think because, I mean, although I'd been you know, I, I consider myself a very young musician and uh, especially uh, within, within the study of, of Indian music, you know, I'll have a couple more lifetimes where I'll come back and get a deeper understanding. But a lot of what I'd write would come from more of an impression of Indian classical music and my impression of jazz and my impression of the world around me. But of course, as I've gotten older and had more experience and spent more time learning from the various Indian artists I get to perform with, I think, you know, my understanding has gotten better. And, you know, try to write a piece that I think maybe even more evokes Indian classical music, um, like this uh, Rupakthal composition that, um, that you've played with me. Um, in 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 Char uh. and I think you know an Indian artist hears that it it sounds familiar enough even if it's not like oh that's a known Bandesh. It's not, but it's going to right away say, oh yeah, I hear that. They can hear the, the cycle is clear. The raga, I think, is, is reasonably well stated. So, and, it, and it's fun for me to um, sit with something that feels like it comes from me, but um, also comes from somewhere else. You know, in this case, comes from India and, and uh, gives me really gives me the opportunity to explore my understanding of the of the study i've done for for so long um so georgie would you like to play a little bit for us uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the especially this piece uh, you know with the alap and then leading it into the piece that you just played for us would you like to elaborate that through uh, some uh, playing for all of us 
Yeah, I can. I can. I, I wish my. I wish you were here. <laughs> <laughs> I wish so too. <laughs> I'll look a little bit at at this. You like I'll play a little lap with that, and then play a little bit of the composition and see. Sure, sure. <laughs> बात है क्या बात है इनक्रेडिबल 
Georgie, this has been so wonderful. Thank you for, you know, this absolutely incredible rendition of these three pieces that, you know, you've been, uh, you performed for us and uh, you've been so inspired uh, by Indian music uh, to write these pieces and, you know, you merge them with, you know, from where you belong, jazz world. So thank you so much. Uh, incredible. Uh, people are loving it. So thank you so much for being here again and taking time to do this. And um, I would love to now talk about your journey. I mean, you know, your childhood and how this all started. Uh, what drew you to saxophone? I mean, you know, from a New Yorker to India and back and forth. And, you know, what a wonderful journey this has been. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, can I share my screen? Sure. Let's see if I can do this. I found a very... Um, Um, let's see if I can find this picture first. I've just recently found, I was going through some old boxes and found a very funny picture of myself at a, uh... okay, here we go. Let's see if there's a way to do this. <laughs> okay, so I just, oh, I just click on share screen, host disabled. It sounds like you have to enable something. Yeah, this Zoom gets really confusing. So I'm not sure how to do this. Is that is that your desktop that I have to share? Yeah, yeah. I hope this works. Oh, it's asking for some privacy grant and all that. Okay, well then, then we won't we won't do it. But I have a I have a funny picture of me. Um, I can't be more than two or three years old, and my oh, father. Wow. What? Oh, do you see it? No. 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 Uh, <laughs> only my description. Okay, so my uh, my father was a journalist, but he had, um, you know, he actually I don't know if he drafted or was enlisted, but you know, at World War II when everybody was in the army. And luckily he, well, he was, his age was such that he was in the army, but the war ended by the time his training um, ended. So he was stationed in Hawaii, of all places, playing trombone in, uh, in I think he was driving a forklift during the day and, and playing trombone at night. I've got a picture of me standing with, and I don't, I don't remember this, but some kind of funny little um, drum kit, actually. Oh, it's on your desktop, or you could have just held it for us. Uh, you know, maybe I can hold it up with uh, through my phone. I think I may have it on my phone. So, well, and I have to explain that in this picture, um, here it is. Um, my father isn't wearing pants, which... Oh, Wow. So that's you. That's that's me standing at a drum kit. And this is New Year's Eve. And apparently every, I don't know, every New Year's Eve, at least for a while, when I was little, my father would put on a tuxedo, but only the top. And he'd be wearing boxer shorts on the bottom and play uh, When the Saints Go Marching In on the trombone at midnight. And I guess I was awake. And, and I guess I had a drum kit, which I don't remember, but it's there in the picture. And it's got like, uh, you know, like, cowboys and ponies on it i don't know if you can wow. see, see the drum kit so and and i mean this is kind of before my you know really my memory kicks in but you were asking how i got to the saxophone in those days in the public schools where we went and most public schools in the u.s had school bands that was just that was how you know, I didn't grow up in a family of musicians, even though my father played some trombone and he loved music. But um, so uh, when you were 10 years old, you got to choose an instrument. And I, now I'm seeing maybe why, but I, I remember I told my mother I wanted to play the drums and she was like, oh God, no, that's gonna be, you know, she was like, she thought that would make her crazy. She had, I'm one of three boys. So there were, you know, three young boys running around making her crazy already. So she said, no, you have to play. And I'm sorry, because I know you're a drummer. She said, you have to play a musical instrument first. <laughs> wow. 
So I just chose the saxophone pr pretty much randomly. And uh, I think she didn't realize how loud a saxophone was, you know, and walking <laughs> around the house, on, 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 on. But um, I also, but, but pr even prior to that, I liked performing. I liked to sing. I was like doing some community acting when I was like five years old in, you know, community theater. And I would often get up in the school, you know, if they didn't have something to do during the assembly or they had some time to kill, they would invite me up on stage to sing. So, you know, I, I didn't mind being in front of a crowd from a young age. But so I started learning, you know, to read West, to read notation, um, play band music, um, kept at it. Uh, I had a, you know, that was elementary school, junior high school. There was a, a little bit more sophisticated band teacher who um, taught us the beginning uh, concept of improvisation. So he started what they called a stage band, which uh, was kind of like a jazz band. There was the concert band and then just began toying with the idea of improvisation. And a couple of years later, when I was in high school, you know, and I was listening to Jethro Tull and I was listening to the Beatles and I was listening to American, a lot of American folk music was uh, very influ influential in my background. Um, but then when I was like maybe 13, 14, somebody, a uh, young woman in my school said, oh, you gotta listen to this. And it was, uh, I think it was Thelonious Monk, who is a very important architect of bebop music and modern jazz. So Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, I started listening to that. And I grew up just outside of New York City. And with, with a few friends, we started going to the, uh, a club called the Village Vanguard, which is one of the you know, iconic um, jazz clubs in New York City. In those days, the drinking age was 18. So legally you had to be 18 to go into a club, but things were pretty relaxed. So 14, 15, 16, it, they, they would let us in. And I got, you know, because of when I was born, I did get to hear some of the, you know, the, the real legends of the music pianist, Bill Evans, McCoy Tyner, Sonny Rollins, vocalist Betty Carter. Um, so I got more, I was getting more serious on my own and listening, trying to figure things out on my own with some of the other kids I went to school with. But I did, um, I was also kind of following a, a path to be a doctor. So, and uh, worked actually the la last year of my high school, I, I did it, instead of going to school, I worked in a hospital for a pediatric cardiologist. I had some kind of special program that I did. I went off to college to be pre-med, but that's where I started, you know, like my very early professional playing. I started playing um, in an R&B and funk band. I started, uh, you know, still trying, exploring some jazz. So we would play around um, the the club, this was in upstate New York, we'd play around the clubs. Um, the band was what they called a mixed band, um, which meant there were black musicians and white musicians, which at that time, this is the mid seventies, but that was still a problem in upstate New York. There were a lot of, most clubs were like black clubs or white clubs. There were very few that would accept a mixed band. And we often performed at the Air Force Base because that was a, you know, sort of legally integrated environment. So we were able to uh, per perform there, which was kind of, you know, pretty bizarre for me coming from New York City, which felt much more, uh, I don't know, the word is modern in its, in its views of integration, or at least my perception of it. Um, so I started performing up there in clubs, playing dance music, and then we'd also play you know, we'd had like a jazz gig. So just starting to explore that. And I kept getting more involved in the music and, uh, and wound up leaving college, coming back to New York, studying with a great saxophonist named Frank Foster, who had been in the Count Basie band, was co at that time was playing with the Thel Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra at, at the Village Vanguard. Um, so he was really my first connection to 
the jazz lineage and you know what is a jazz saxophonist and what are they really thinking about and how do they think about music and uh, I did that for about six months while I applied to um, a number of music programs uh, there were at that time Berkeley College of Music was there and there were a couple of other jazz programs maybe one or two in the country and one was at New England Conservatory and that's where I wound up going you know this you must know the school because you've spent time in Boston. Yes. And um, <clears throat> a couple of things happened there. I had a great saxophone teacher named Joe Allard, who um, focused on really on sound development. He wasn't didn't teach me about theory or improvisation, but he was into studying the overtones and 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 harmonics and learning how those harmonics color the sound. Now later this would come to mean a lot as I was sitting with my Indian Guruji, Pandit Pranath, great vocalist, who looking at the Shrutis, looking how the shape of the mouth affects what, wow. what sounds are coming above. You know, if you change the vowel shape of the mouth, the harmonics change. You, you may be singing sa, but you may hear pa really clearly. You may hear komal ni really clearly. You may hear ga really clearly. And he was kind of a master of controlling breath, controlling these harmonics. So those kind of things were, you know, I didn't know at the time, but they, they would come together. But before NEC, before New England Conservatory, had you been to India before that? Did you meet? No, your no, 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 no. And it was, I mean, the only, my only experience of Indian music was um, George Harrison's Concert for Bangladesh record on which, uh, uh, Ravi, Ravi Ravi and, Abhi. and and Abhiji, right? Yes, are playing together. But to be honest, I was like, I when I first heard that, I didn't understand it. it I didn't, you know, it's like, I understand the rock and roll, this other stuff, I don't know. But the other fortunate thing about New England Conservatory um, is that Peter Rowe had just arrived there, and you, I think you've probably met him. At, yes, I met him a couple of times. Okay, and so he he had just arrived from India. I think he'd been living there for the last six or seven years, getting his master's degree and his PhD. And for for no reason, for no clear reason that I can remember, when I was looking to fill one elective course spot, I took something called a uh, a survey of Indian classical music, and. You know, the class was interesting, but the listening assignments were what kind of blew my mind. I would go down into the basement of the conservatory and put the the actual records on the thing. And I started listening to V.G. Jog, to Ram Narayan, to Ali Akbar Khan, to the Dagger brothers. And wow. At the same time that I was like really starting to listen carefully to John Coltrane, to McCoy Tyner. And to me, I saw the same thing, you know, and I felt the same thing. And um, really immediately tried to start play, you know, like try to figure out, okay, what is, and I remember the first raga we learned was rag Yemen. And so you know, how can I do that on the saxophone? What does that mean? But in Peter's class, I learned sargam. You know, I learned the form of tintal. And that kind of started, yeah. that began my journey. At the same time, romance, I was living in a large house and this woman came to live there. You know that woman now, <laughs> Emily, my wife. So she had come. And she was actually, um, she'd become involved in, uh, in Sufism through uh, Pirvalayat Khan, who um, was the son of uh, Hazrat Nayat Khan. Okay, so from the, that kind of Delhi, Shisti, Sufi order. So she had come into my life and um, was interested in spirit, Indian, you know, spirituality. She moved to California, wound up at Mills College where Pandit Pranath was teaching and Terry Riley was teaching. And she kept saying, oh, you've got to come to California. It's amazing. So 
these things were coming together. I'm studying Indian music. I'm studying jazz. I'm, you know, trying to write a little bit of music. But then I graduated from the conservatory. I came out to California to be with Emily. And a year after being here, oh, and actually I should say that one of the first gigs I got in California was playing at an Indian restaurant, uh, Pasand, which was like the first uh, South Indian restaurant, I think maybe in America. Um, and I would, was playing with a woman named Lisa Moscow, who now uh, goes by the name Sangeeta Moscow, who was a Sarod player, student of Ali Akbar Khan. So, you know, I, I really knew next to nothing, but for my $15 and all I could eat, I would play in, uh, in this restaurant. And uh, Emily, my wife, applied for a grant her last year. She was in her last year of, uh, of undergraduate music studies at Mills College. And she applied for a grant that she got that brought her to India and she took me. So that was wow. my first trip. This is 1980. We spent 10 months in Delhi and that's where I really became um, close to my Guruji Pandit Pranath. And how did you How did you find How did you find your Guruji in India? Well, he he was teaching He was teaching at Mills College. He was oh. He was Emily's teacher. He was, as well as Terry Riley's teacher, and I hadn't really. I mean, I'd once seen him and gotten to say Namaste, and he had actually sent. Emily to study with a student of his, a woman named uh, Sri Karuna Mai, who lived at the Sri Aurobindo Ashram in Delhi. And, uh, well, these, I don't know how far you want to get into this, but we arrived in Delhi to study with her. And we had this kind of Western concept of, okay, you know, it'll be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from one to three. You know, and she's like, you have many lifetimes to do this work. First, you must get a tambora. The only good tamboras are made in, I don't know, I think she said Madhya Pradesh, but I have two of them in 90 tal. If you go get them, you can bring them back and we can begin our study. So our studies began with this trek to the Sri Aurobindo, the not yet constructed Sri Aurobindo ashram in 90 tal on the top of a hill. So, and I mean, you, you can imagine in 1980 riding in a bus with a soldier sleeping in front of me with his rice, rifle bouncing up and down, like kind of hitting me in the face and me trying to, and while, while looking over at the side of all the, you know, everybody's reading their Gita out loud. So in case the bus falls off the cliff, they've got the name of God on their lips when they, when they perish. So, you know, and this is a time when there are no phones in India, there's no computers. Everything is just, you pray and things happen. So, you know, I spent time in Nanital. We brought the tambores back. We started studying with her some, but then uh, my Guruji, Pandit Pranath, who spent kind of half the year in America and half the year in Delhi, um, came, came back to India. And um, he and I just, we, we hit it off for a couple of reasons. Um, as I told you, I had had this kind of medical, pre-medical training and Guruji had uh, suffered a heart attack a year before and was a little bit, I'd say a little frail and a little, um, you know, little, a little nervous because of this. And he liked the fact that I was what he called the Ada doctor, half, half a doctor. So I had a you know, little bit of medical understanding. I also, as you've experienced, I know how to cook. Oh. And, and um, he was on a salt-free diet. And nobody in India <laughs> would cook food without salt for him. But I would cook for him. I'm also pretty good at massage. So between being a doctor and uh, cook and <laughs> massage, we kind, we kind of became um, close rather, rather quickly. And um, he he decided to teach me, which was which was which was quite nice. And and actually, um, we we went we went to Mumbai together. We went to and then it was Bombay. We went to Bombay together to visit his friend. You know, my Guruji was born in Lahore at the same time uh, as Alaraka 
Kansab is Bidhi Sharma from Ricky Ram. So they were like childhood friends. So we went to Bombay to visit Alaraka. So I went to that Nip and See Road apartment back in 1980. Um, you know, just as a skinny, skinny little guy, keeping my mouth shut and my ears open. Um, visited him, visited the composer Opie Nair in his wow. luxurious apartment uh, up overlooking the sea. Uh, some other childhood friends of my Guruji. And that's, that's actually where he started teaching me Sa and Pa, <laughs> which is, and, and then he had Ricky Ram make um, tamboras for us. So I have these, uh, I'll, bring, I'll bring one into the picture. He had, um, he had designed um, these, what he said were kind of the original style tamboras with no, um, no lacquer, ebony cool. bridge, sandalwood beads. Um, That's quite a beauty. Yeah, yes. And wow. So we actually, at, at that time, we, we spent the first few months living at the Sri Aurobindo ashram out, out near the Kutab Minar. And we would just do our riyas every morning, singing Bharav, and in the evening, singing Yemen. You know, it was a uh, very quiet, sl slow, slow time. But I did have my saxophone and I had, at that time I played flute as well. I don't, I don't really play it much because this position is kind of uncomfortable for me. So that's, you know, that's kind of the beginning of it. Came back to California uh, where, and Krishna Bhatt was living here. Um, I do happen to have, oh. I've got a few pictures I can show. So here's Krishna in those days the, oh, wow. uh, from the uh, Vishwamohan Bhatt family, his father, Shashi, Shashi Mohan. Um, and Krishna, I've also got a picture here, as long as we're doing this. This is me and, my, and Guruji in New Delhi in 1980. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you, you still look the same, though. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but... Um, So, yeah, so, you know, the fortunate thing is that Cal Northern California was kind of the center for Indian classical music. Pandit Pranath was living here. Krishnabhat literally lived um, maybe a three-minute walk or two-minute walk from my house. The very next lane is, it was, his, was his house. So we were able to spend a lot of musical time together, and he was um, very instrumental in showing me, you know, what <laughs> showing me what you know what an Indian classical musician is? I mean, my Guruji was not approachable in the same way that somebody my age would be. So, um, wow! So, I, so you did spend a lot of time with uh, Krishna Ji uh, in California. You, I think, you have some albums together, also, right? We, yes, my very first album um, was is with. Uh, is this one? Let's see. I'll take it out of its. Uh, it's called "Lasting Impression." Ah. And although I had met, um, I had met Zakir, and maybe even had played with him a little bit uh, with Terry Riley. Um, it was actually at a dinner at Krishna's house where. Um, I had started, I think I, I can't remember if we had started recording or if we were just about to record, but I was sitting um, at dinner with Krishna and Zakirbhai, and he said, oh, well, why don't you, uh, you know, why don't you have me play on the album? And wow. I was like, so, and I think at that time, you know, I'd maybe just heard making music. Right, you know, Zakir's record with uh, John and Hariji and Jan Garbarek. And I was, you know, anyway, Zakir was already, you know, extremely prominent. So when he said that, I think I called the next day and I said, Did you mean that? And can I afford it? <laughs> and he said, Yes, I meant it. And 
let's not talk about money. Let's let's talk about music. And um, yeah, so that that was the beginning of the relationship. He came in. I think it was you know a very Zakir moment. We're in the studio recording. I think he he flew in from somewhere, drove from you know went to his house on his way to the airport to catch a flight to somewhere else. He came into the studio, uh, played on this, on this, on well, on two pieces, one which was straightforward and one which had uh, different time signatures. You know, it was like four, four, and then it was 11, and then it was seven. And I started to explain it to him. He goes, just sit in the studio with me, puts on the headphones, and I would go like, <laughs> as, as things were coming up, one take, played this beautiful on this piece called uh, uh, Days, of, uh, yeah, Days of Rain. And this other one, Taj Express, that I've performed uh, quite a bit in India. And then he flew out and uh, we finished the album. And later, I guess, Tony called me and said, you know, Zakir would like to put the record out on, on Moment Records. Wow. And, uh, so that you know that level of um of exposure was you know kind of essential i would say in 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 bringing me to the attention of the indian music community the wider indian music community so how 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 did that relationship evolve with zakir bhai you know i mean uh, you've then worked with him for many many years and you still continue to do that uh, as and when possible, right? So, yeah. How, well, how did that kind of uh, you know help bridge uh, you know with the Indian community for you? Well, if if I remember correctly, we made that album, and then he at that time was performing with his group, the Rhythm Experience, and uh, I did some touring with that group as kind of like a special guest. Tony would dance. Um, I would play, and then you know Vince Delgado and Tommy Kessaker and uh, Arshad and Dana. I think you know, so it was kind of a percussion ensemble. But Tommy played vibes, uh, so there was that tuned element. I would come in and play. Uh, I think mainly my compositions. I can't remember if we were if we were doing Zakiris, but we did some, you know, great tours around the US, Zakir as the driver <laughs> in the van. Um, and then because this album went well, we, we kind of immediately embarked on a second one, uh, Night Spinner, which, um, yeah, I've got that here as well, which was the second album I made for Moment Records. And this one was a, was sort of a bigger Wow. In de endeavor and uh, brought in some other guest artists. Ashish Khan performs on it and Sultan Khan Saab performs on it. And that was, I remember that just blowing my mind. I mean, you know, that, I mean, my, my writing was getting more developed and, you know, the fact that I would, was sitting there with these musicians who really seemed, you know, to come from, way beyond any place I ever imagined being, were, would be sitting in this studio with me, rehearsing, uh, learning the music, and, and, and putting their heart and soul into it, which just was, you know, I felt so overwhelmed and, and kind of grateful for that. And uh, yeah, I've got, to, so recorded this album, which ha has some very beautiful things. My Guruji had passed away. Um, there's a piece on there called The Light Never Leaves Your Eyes that um, Molly Holm, who uh, vocalist, say, wrote the words and sings on that. Um, Tommy Kessker, the vibes player from the Rhythm Experience is playing on it. Um, so that, I think that second album then maybe reached uh, the ears of... Um, someone who's producing a concert with Hari G. And uh, so I was called to do a concert with 
Hariprasad Charasya, Viku Vinayak Ram, Swapan Chowdhury, and Larry Coriel. Wow. So that was my, and that was my first encounter with Larry, was um, at this big concert at the Masonic Auditorium in San Francisco. And a little unusual in the, in the global fusion, you know, bringing these masters together, we actually had a couple of days to rehearse beforehand, to hang out with each other, to, to work on material. And that became an album uh, that was put out on Navras called Music Without Boundaries. So things kind of kept expanding from there. I should mention, though, that while this was happening, I was also working a great deal with Terry Riley, who is another, you know, extremely um, important mentor. Well, I, I think I had the honor of playing for his 80, 80th birthday or something with Kalaji uh, in San Francisco. You came to attend that concert, didn't yes. you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So Terry, you know, Terry's... To me, the, the, the Western musician who's really dived the deepest into, into Indian classical music. He, you know, is a devout practicer of Khayal music from the Karana tradition, sings raga every morning, sings raga every night. I mean, he's, a, he's an incredibly uh, disciplined, creative, beautiful being. And during this period of the 80s and the 90s, I would tour with him a lot. So his understanding of bridging these Western and Indian worlds um, had, you know, has, has had, a, I would say, a profound effect on, on me. And we would often tour with, um, with Krishna Bhatt. So Terry, myself, and Krishna would tour as a trio, I would tour with Terry as a duo. He, he had a group called Kayal that was like Terry on, uh, on piano, me on saxophones, uh, different musicians on bass, uh, Molly Holm on vocal, and sometimes Krishna on either sitar or tabla. He, you know, he's a, as many musicians in India, if they're an instrumentalist, they also play tabla because that's where the rhythmic language comes from so i had this going i was also touring with etta james and playing lots of blues and r&b so i was straddling a lot of worlds and having three children <laughs> so wow so there was there was a lot going on a lot of influences in my life and uh and after i should say that after this night spinner album came out and and the uh, other one lasting impression I got a call from Steve Smith, the drummer who was famous for his work with uh, the rock band Journey, and just in general being a very, uh, you know, masterful drummer. And he got in touch with me and said, you know, hey, I've heard your work. Um, I, you know, I don't know if he said it directly, but I think the, I'm interested in working with Zakir. If you're going to make an album with him again, I'd like to be there. And it just so happened that I kind of was getting ready to record um, the Summit CD, which, you know, I think was a bit of a milestone for, for me. And Kai I had met, I forget how, probably just playing a, what we call a casual gig here, but, you know, he loved his playing, loved his, who he was as a human being. And... Um, he introduced me to Fareed Haq, and we put the summit session together, all working in the studio. And I have to say, going back to what I played at the beginning, this uh, frame master, we were in the studio, and uh, Steve was just kind of keeping chuck, chuck, chuck while we played the Lahara for Zakir to play the Peshkar. And we're in the studio, and Zakir starts playing, and Steve's like, wait a minute, what is that? What is that? Show it to me. And he sits, you know, on the floor at Zakir's feet and Zakir plays like the opening phrase and Steve's counting it out and you know finally gets the opening phrase and he goes okay and, and then that repeats and Zakir's like no it never nothing ever <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like guys I'm paying for a recording studio we're gonna have to do this lesson later 
but that started this incredible journey for Steve and for me. And, and it actually opened the door for me to, car to, the, to Carnatic uh, rhythmic um, theory, because wow. that, that had been Steve's... Um, Forte. Kind of, well, it had been his introduction to, 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 to the, the rhythmic world. And it was, it was really something that he could wrap his brain around uh, more easily than, um, than the North Indian system. One, because he hadn't been exposed to it. And two, the tabla language is, is, is more complicated. Uh, Konakol keeps things simple. There's no combination of strokes. It's, it's counting. And um, it, it just sort of resonated with the way Steve, Steve thinks. So I, you know, it's kind of funny that my, you know, kind of my first teacher of Carnatic rhythmic theory was Steve Smith, who probably got it from, uh, you know, in, in Europe from Hakeem Luden, who also wasn't uh, necessarily a Carnatic artist. But then, you know, through Zakir, I met uh, Ganesh and Kumaresh. Um, and I mean, so many others, but so I started learning the Carnatic language as, as well. And, and, uh, so, how, I mean, how does it feel, uh, Georgie, to be a pioneer of so many different genres, uh, you know, to be an ambassador for so many different genres, to bring it all together and then present a new sound, you know, uh, some new creativity, uh, writing pieces, which kind of encompass all these different genres. I mean, it's so much of work. It's so much of creativity. There's so much of information there, jazz and Indian classical, North and South and, you know, tabla repertoire. And I mean, so, so much going on. I mean, uh, how does it feel this whole journey? I mean, you know, last uh, 50 years, at least, you know, I think have been so intense, intense, for, uh, you know, with your journey in music. So uh, um, how, how, how do you feel about it? You know, I've really always felt like a student. You know, I mean, I mean, being on stage with somebody like Hari Prasad Charasia, I'm just like l hanging on for dear life and, and, and hoping to learn, you know, and that's, and that's, you know, if I get to sit with Alam Khan and I'm like, man, this guy's grandfather was Baba Alauddin Khan. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm like, that, that blows my mind that I'm kind of having some sort of relationship with that lineage. So, wow. and it's just kind of, you know, it's not like I set out to do it. I was just kind of, you know, I was following my instincts. I would sit down, you know, a lot of what, what jazz uh, players do to learn, and I, I know this is, is, is transcription. So we've got to, you know, I can't go meet John Coltrane, but I can sit with a John Coltrane record and say, wait, what is he doing there? But I found myself doing that with, with Badi Gulam Ali Khan. You know, what is he doing? How is he approaching this? Bismillah Khan, what, what, is, what is that? So, you know, my interests go back and forth. I spend a lot of time playing the piano to learn the American song tradition, you know, the jazz masters, uh, you know, the, the composers whose um, popular music became the underpinning of jazz, people like, uh, George Gershwin and Cole Porter, these musicians from the 40s and 50s, these composers who wrote these songs that they were popular music in the day, but they became the, um, the, uh, the foundation of a lot of, a lot of jazz performers. So, you know, I've, it's, it's more that I just feel that I've been blessed to meet some incredible musicians who have been very generous with their knowledge and with their talents sharing with me. And it's, uh, you know, I certainly couldn't have predicted that this is where I would go, even when I first, even when I became, you know, uh, in my mind, a serious student of music, I was just interested in jazz at that time. And the, the whole Indian pathway has been you know, both my effort as well as incredible good fortune of people like you, you know, who've been generous with their time, generous with their talent, uh, Krishna Bhatt, you know, the fact that I 
was living a block away from Krishna Bhatt and five blocks away from Pandit Pranath. I mean, he was, you know, we're all like in the same neighborhood and then not far from Ali Akbar Khan, not far from Zakir Hussain. You know, this was some kind of incredible good fortune. Wonderful. I mean, you know, I would just, uh, I wish we could keep uh, continuing to talk to you and listening to all these wonderful experiences. But, uh, you know, there is always a, a time restraint. So I would like to thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I would like to thank you uh, immensely for your time, for these great insights, for uh, sharing your wonderful journey. And uh, what, a, what a journey it has been. And, you know, uh, uh, such a wonderful ambassador for bringing two great cultures together and bridging that gap and, you know, creating something new. Uh, being a pioneer of, in so many ways for world music, uh, you know, so many genres, uh, all all put into one, you know, something that's uh, uh, one, you being one of the uh, leading uh, musicians in the world who's done all that. So uh, we are extremely thankful on behalf of Jankar, on behalf of all the wonderful viewers who've been watching this. Uh, we are extremely thankful. I wish we had more time, but we look forward to, uh, you know, talking with you some other time as well. And uh, we are extremely thank you, Georgie, for this wonderful, wonderful time you shared with us. Well, I mean, it's, it's really been my pleasure. Uh, there are a lot of people who've been important to me who I've left out, you know, and the Vinayak Ram family and, uh, you know, you, Rajesh, who we just, you and I just performed with. So I hope this all clears up. We get to be together again. We get to uh, perform and see each other and... Uh, Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it and uh, be safe. Love, love to your family, your, your children, your grandchild, everybody Thank you. Thank you. and be safe and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Georgie. Okay. Thanks to all the viewers for watching us. We'll see you next week, same time with another guest. So do tune in and stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Namaste. Bye. 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 -bye.